If you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12 today. Hebrews chapter 12. We've been in a series called The Epic of Christ. And I almost said Excel still more, but that was a couple series ago. We've been in a series called The Epic of Christ, and we finished that together. We've seen how all of Scripture points us forward to Jesus, the Messiah, and how He is everything for everyone. He's what the world was made for. He was made by Him, through Him, and to Him. Everything in our lives is about Jesus. And so we're getting ready to go into a series called All In. We're getting ready to begin a campaign, a stewardship campaign called All In. But when I say stewardship campaign, many of you who've been in church for a long time, you inserted the word financial stewardship into that. And while financial is a part of this, I want us to understand stewardship is much bigger than just how you handle money. It's every aspect of our lives. And we're going to be in that series starting next Sunday. But today, I wanted to do kind of like a, a preface or a prelude to our series. So I'm really cheating a little bit, right? Uh, this is kind of like a tack on to the front end of it. But I wanted us to consider the question of how we can be all in. I want us to think about what it means to be all in. And as I was praying through how we should consider these things, the Lord led me to Hebrews chapter 12. There's many other places I thought about going, but Hebrews 12 is just perfect. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, is, uh, is a book that was written to Hebrew Christians, hence the name. Hebrews. And these Hebrew Christians were living all throughout the Roman world, and they were tempted to abandon Jesus and go back to their old ways because it was hard to be a Christian. It can be hard to be a Christian in the world because Christ came into the world, but the world knew him not. He was the light of the world and the darkness hated him. So all of us who are in Christ find it difficult to be genuine Christians in the world. And the Hebrews of that day were having a hard time. They were having a hard go at it. And the author of the book of Hebrews, most people don't believe that it was Paul. There's some debate about that. Some people think it was either Apollos or maybe Barnabas. I think it's important that we understand whoever it was, they probably knew Paul really well because a lot of the themes are very, very similar. But the author of the book of Hebrews is directing the Hebrew Christian's eyes back to Jesus. And they're saying Jesus is better. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises. All this stuff that you're thinking about going back to, you can't go back to that because Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. He is the better Adam, the better Moses, the better Abraham, the better David. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's trying to help them remember that Jesus is worth it. So you need to hold fast and you need to be all in. Let's look at what he says in chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. This is what the author of Hebrews says. He says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us understand and apply his word to our lives. Lord, we thank you for this day. And God, for bringing us here together to worship you, to fellowship together. But Lord, we thank you for your word to us, speaking to us so that we can know you, God. Help us to know you better through your word that that I will be proclaiming today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. He's laying it out for them. What does it mean to be all in? What does that mean? We can say that all we want, and we understand that, I think, for the most part, to be all in. But what does it really look like? He, he really does break it down and make it simple so we know what it looks like. Ultimately, to be all in means you're committed, right? You're committed. One way for us to state this as Christians is this way. It, it means that every single thing that we do is done for the purpose of glorifying God by living for Jesus and making disciples of his name. But I want to state it a little bit differently than that because if we're not careful, you can say, everything I do is for your glory, Lord. I can drink milkshakes to the glory of God. I can spend all of my time working on cars and neglecting my family to the glory of God in my mind. I can find ways to justify what I do, saying it's for the glory of God, without it really being glorious to God. And I want us to be very particular and very specific. It's not just saying everything I do is for the glory of God. Really? You know that the Bible says whether you eat or drink, Do all to the glory of God? Oh man, he's getting really specific. Every single thing. Well, here, let's say it another way. Let's say it another way. What does it mean to be all in? It means that we have to decide every day to say yes to some things and to say no to many other things for the purpose of glorifying God by living for Jesus and making disciples of his name. It means I have to specifically decide yes to this, no to that. There are a lot of things that we have to say no to in our lives to be all in for Jesus. But the flip side's true. There's a lot of things that we need to say yes to in order to be all in for Jesus. And we can't lose sight of that. What this means is that we have to prioritize the activities of our lives and really ask ourselves the question, is this really about glorifying God by living for Jesus and making disciples of his name? Or is it about me getting what I want? As I thought through this series that we're going to be getting into, uh, I recognize that toes will be stepped on. Mine included. And I want to encourage you, if your toes get stepped on over the next few weeks, I understand it's okay if you get upset with me. That's okay. I I get it. But I want to encourage you. I'm going to do everything in my power not to say something because it's my opinion, but I'm going to say it because it's found here in God's word. And so my hope is that when our toes get stepped on, It's God saying, hey, pay attention. That's my prayer. If you have any issues with something that I talk about as we go into God's word over these next few weeks or really ever, don't write me an angry email. Don't don't do that. Come and talk to me. I would love to talk to you. We can disagree about things and still love each other. I'm okay with that, and I'm working to get even better at that. 
And so if the Lord steps on your toes, let's talk about it together. Because I bet you that he stepped on my toes in very similar ways. And I'm pretty sure other people's toes are getting stepped on too. So that's a disclaimer. I'm just telling you that. Let's handle these things well. Because when God starts saying, hey, are you all in? He's going to start pointing at things and saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? The author of Hebrews gives us some really clear things. The verbs, the words that he uses in this. He, the first point is the first set of verbs. He says, lay aside. Point number one, lay aside. How is it that we can be all in? You have to lay aside some things. Verse 1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and sin. What's the deal with the cloud of witnesses? What is that all about? Chapter before, Hebrews 11, many people call it the hall of faith. Um, oftentimes, it's the, you just look through and you look at failure after failure after failure, and the Bible is like, look at these heroes, and you're like, Wow, this guy messed up. That guy messed up. This lady messed up. But then it says, these are some of whom the world is not worthy. Wow. These are the cloud of witnesses who are before us, who endured some of the craziest things you can imagine for the sake of knowing God and being known by God, walking with him. Never even knowing the Messiah but knowing that he was going to come. That's our cloud of witnesses. And what the author of Hebrews is doing is he's making a big analogy. He's setting the stage for making you think about, and the the Christian Hebrews that lived in the Roman world would have immediately understood a stadium. He's setting up this idea of a stadium where people are around and they're cheering you on. And he's setting up the idea of a race. And he's saying, we have a cloud of witnesses, people who have gone before us, who have run the race before us, and they're saying, come on, you can do it. They're a cloud of witnesses that testify to the faithfulness of God, who we can look to and say, David did it? Well, okay, like, I think I can make this. And so if we have this cloud of witnesses, he says, what do you got to do? Step one, you got to lay some things aside. He says, lay aside, cast off, get rid of encumbrances. Encumbrances. That's what the New American Standard Bible says. English Standard Version says weight or hindrance. Again, this is the analogy of running a race. And he's saying, you've got weight on you that you need to throw away so that you can run your race. A weight is an impediment. It's something that slows you down. It makes it so much harder to run when you've got a 50-pound backpack on your back. It's difficult. And he says, take it off and throw it away. What is he talking about? What are encumbrances? What are weights in the lives of these Hebrew Christians? Well, we don't know exactly. He doesn't tell us specifically what he's saying there, but what's great about that is that it's pretty clear to us that it's really anything. It can actually be anything in your life. Most of the time, the way people talk about this is, you know, he says encumbrances, these weights, and then he says, and sin. Some people see those as the same exact thing, but most people recognize that he's kind of making a distinction There are things in your life that hold you back, that distract you, that that slow you down from walking and being with the Lord. Things that you prioritize over Jesus that maybe are very good things. We were talking about this in our Sunday school class. They might be really good things, but they are not the best thing. And so they become a weight. They slow you down. And I would argue that most of the time, Almost invariably, something that has become more important to you, something that you prioritize over walking with Jesus, what do we normally call that? What's the word that we use to describe those things in our lives? Idols. 
We call those idols. We might not even realize that there are good things in our lives that are actually idols. There are probably things, I, I, not probably, there are definitely things in every single one of our lives that we hold on to, and it is something that is good, but because we hold on to it so tightly, it has become something that we love maybe even more than the Lord himself. And you always know that's true when the Lord says, I'm going to need you to give that to me now. Have you ever experienced that in your life? Where there's something in your life that you love so much, and the Lord says, and I'm going to need you to give that to me now. Those are good things that sometimes become encumbrances, weights, hindrances, something that's stopping you from being all in. Clearly, there are sins. Clearly, there are sins. Ephesians 4.22, he talks about this. He says, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. So this is why you know whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was really close with Paul because they're saying almost the same things. He says, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. There are sins in our lives that are stopping us from experiencing everything that God has had, a, had for us to experience. And it's really easy for us to try to pick and choose our sins, right? And I've even heard people be like, well, yeah, yeah, but that's your opinion, and you know what? There might be my opinions about certain things where it's like, I think that this is unwise. But the Bible doesn't say you can't do it. The Bible doesn't say it's sinful. So that's really a call for you. But then there's other things in the Bible that are just point blank sin. And all you have to do is read a little bit around to know what he's talking about. We know exactly some of the things that the writer of Hebrews was thinking. In Hebrews 10, 25, he calls out neglecting to meet with the church. He says that's a sin. It is wrong to neglect meeting together with the body of Christ. That's one of the things that he's saying, throw that sin away. Stop letting something get in the way of you coming to church. Throw that sin away and meet with the body of Christ. In Hebrews 13, 4, he says that faithlessness in the marriage bed is sinful. Get rid of that. Don't let anything get close to that. Then he says right after that, the love of money and being discontent is sinful. It's not honoring to God. So when we ask the question, okay, yeah, yeah, throw away the sins that so easily entangle us, it's easy for us to try to justify our own pet sins but not when you're actually reading the Bible. When you actually read the Bible and you hear what he says and he calls out specific things in our lives, you can't escape it. He's trying to cut the cancer of sin out of your life. And so what we need to do when we hear this exhortation from the author of Hebrews, when he says, lay aside the sin which so easily entangles you, all you need to do is just think about what is, it that, what is it that you hold on to? What's the sin in your life that you know is there? It's so easy for you to fall into. It's the thing that you're so quickly tempted to jump right back into. And yeah, that is a little different from person to person. There might be things in my life that are not that difficult for me to ignore, not that difficult for me to lay aside. But there might be things in your life that you find incredibly difficult to say no to. But what is that? Are you praying about that? Are you going to the Lord about that? You see, in this analogy of racing, this analogy that he's building, throwing off this weight of encumbrances and sins is everything. It's everything. I mean, weight is everything in a race. Think about it. Athletes go to extreme lengths to reduce weight and increase aerodynamics. 
I was trying to think through, you know, if you just think about some of the sports that we watch, I was, I was trying to think of some specifics, but I'm not great at this because I'm not a huge sports person, but I was, I was just trying to think through like some of the things that athletes wear. I mean, think about it. Some of those things are kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, let's just be honest. It's ridiculous. If you were to just like wear that as your normal outfit, you know, you, the first thing, like we were, we were out eating Chick-fil-A the other day and some people walked in and they were wearing sports attire and it was clear that they had just come from a sporting event. That wasn't their like normal attire because they were dressed for a particular purpose. Swimmers, even shave their legs. I mean, guys, shave their legs. I mean, they're trying to reduce drag in any possible way. They're trying to get rid of friction in every possible way. They're doing anything they can. They're wearing the, the caps, and if they're, if they're so dedicated, they'll shave their heads. They'll do whatever it takes to make sure that they are so aerodynamic that they can move through the water, they can move through the wind when you're running, like whatever it takes to reduce the weight, to reduce the friction. There are so many things in life that keep us from glorifying God. And there are so many things in our lives that we can easily cast off to reduce the friction of living for our Lord and Savior. Think about it. What are those things in your life that are good but are really just getting in the way? What are the things in your life my hair, I'm a, I like my hair, okay? I don't particularly want to shave that off. But if, if I was just absolutely dedicated to winning a race, first of all, I'd have to do a lot of work. <laughs> but that would be something I would probably consider. What do I need to do to win the race? What are those things in your life that are good, but they're actually just getting in the way? What are those sins that you're stuck in. Those things that you keep falling back into that so easily entangle you as you're trying to live for the Lord. What does Jesus tell us to do with those things? He says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He says, find those things in your life and throw it away. And I know, I know how hard it is to hear that because I'm the one who's been thinking about this this whole time. But we need to do this. If we want to be all in, we need to look for the ways in which we are being slowed down by good stuff in our lives and especially by the evil in our lives. And we need to throw it away. Sometimes what that means is You've got to delete some apps off of this thing. Sometimes what it means is you've got to get rid of this thing. But this isn't evil. We are. We have the sin inside. So a lot of times what it means is meeting with somebody and talking to them about what's going on in your life so that they can help you manage the good things in your life for the glory of God. There's a lot of things that we can think about, but we've got to move on. Because if we're doing this, we're casting this away, why? Why are we throwing off these things that are slowing us down? Well, because we have to run the race. Point number two, run the race. That's what he says here in verse one. We're still in verse one. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There are some simple and specific things in life that we need to prioritize. There are things we need to cast off, but guys, there are things that we need to put on. There are things that we need to make the most important thing in our lives. There are things we need to say yes to. And isn't it hard to say yes to things that are difficult in your life? He says that we need to run the race that's set before us. Why is he on about this? What is he talking about? What is, what's this race that's set before us? Well, as Christians, the race that's set before us is 
a life that is like Jesus, a life that is different from the world. And if you were in Sunday school class today, you know that's called sanctification. That's called being made holy as you walk with the Lord. That's the race that's set before us. And guess what? That is hard because we live in a fallen world. The author of Hebrews knew this. He even points this out, reminding them of some of the things that they've overcome. In Hebrews chapter 10, 32 through 34, he mentions mistreatment that they were suffering. He mentions imprisonment that they were going through. He mentions seizure of property. I thought about that and I was like, what would happen if like, people just started seizing up property in Texas because we worship Jesus? That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? But you know what he says in Hebrews 10? He says, you, you gladly welcomed it. Like, that's crazy. He says in verse 34, For you showed sympathy to prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession. What race are we running here? Are we running the American dream race? Or are we running the race of the city of God? It's a very important question we all have to ask ourselves. I don't want anybody coming to my house and seizing my property. That'll be very difficult for me to go through. Something might happen. I don't know. But my hope and prayer is that I would act like somebody who loves Jesus no matter what happens to my property. No matter what happens to my life, whatever happens to my family, whatever happens to my church, I hope that I will act like somebody who loves Jesus. <sighs> That's going to be hard, though, because life is hard in a fallen world, and it's going to happen. We've got we to gotta run the race, so what do we need to do? He says it. <laughs> run with endurance. My favorite word ever, Endurance. Not. That's a joke. I hate endurance. It's my least favorite thing. When I go to the gym, I don't want to endure. I want to just pick up the heaviest weight one time and be done with it. I don't want to go over and over and over again. You people that are running marathons and miles and it's all, it's crazy. You're crazy people. But that's what the Christian life is. So you know what? I better get over it because I'm in the race whether I like it or not. And we can run with endurance. That's what's great about this. We can do it. We might not love it, but we can do it. It's hard in the fallen world, but he says, run the race with endurance. What is this endurance he's talking about? Well, it's other words that we love so much. Self-control, discipline. That's specifically what he's talking about. He's talking about self-control and discipline in your Christian life. How do I know that? Let's turn. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to see how the Apostle Paul says it. Again, so similar. First Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 23. The Apostle Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises what? self control in all things they then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable wreath therefore i run in such a way as not without aim i box in such a way as not beating the air but i discipline my body and i make it my slave so that after i have preached to others i myself will not be disqualified Paul's saying here, in everything I do, I do it for the sake of the gospel. I'm trying to be self-controlled, which that's not bad. 
That's a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. It comes from God. It's good. You can do it if you have Christ. You can have self-control. And it's good. And you can control yourself for the sake of the gospel. You can be disciplined for the sake of running the race of faith. You see, Paul was focused on what he was called to do, and he only pursued that which helped him accomplish his mission. Have you ever had a goal of getting into like better shape or something like that? Has anybody ever set that goal? Like, I'm just going to get into better shape this year or something, right? We've, we've all probably said something like that. Back in the day when I used to work at a gym and I talked to people all the time about those things, they would be like, oh, I'm just going to get in better shape. And they start telling all about these crazy things that they're going to start doing all of a sudden. They've never been doing any of this stuff. And now all of a sudden they're going to be doing everything you can possibly think of to get into better shape. And you know what I would always tell them? I would say, you know what you should do? You should just start coming to the gym. Just start coming to the gym. Like, if, if your first goal, your first thing that you're trying to accomplish is just go to the gym a few times a week, that's something you can do, isn't it? That's something you can attain. That's a goal that's reasonable. And I would help them understand that you might have all these other goals in mind, but if you don't have discipline, you'll never meet them. So you need to set standards for yourself that are reasonable and attainable that you can be disciplined in doing. That's how you start out. Self-control and endurance is not only about saying no to things. It's also about saying yes to the right things over and over and over again. There are specific and simple things that you need to choose over and over and over again in order to be all in. And it's so simple, guys. It's so simple. But here's the reality. Every pastor I talk to, everyone in all of the United States is struggling with this in their churches. We're struggling getting the people to read their Bibles, We're having a hard time getting people to understand that if you want to be a mature Christian, it starts with reading your Bible every day, just a little bit. If you could just open your Bible at some point in the day and begin, you're already on the journey. You're in the race. We're having such a hard time getting people to pray. I think a lot of that's because pastors don't pray. I'll be honest. We don't, corporate prayer? We, we don't really know what corporate prayer means. Corporate prayer means the pastor prays before the sermon, and then we have a, a prayer meeting. Every church I've ever been a part of, this is what we do. We have a prayer meeting where we have a Bible study for the vast majority of the time, and then we pray for about 15 minutes at the most. We actually do a very good job here at Second Baptist. I'm very thankful for that. But, but what about individually? Praying. Talking to your Lord and Savior. We're having a hard time getting people to realize that that's what it looks like to run the race. You know what else is super crazy? Getting people to understand that simply going to church is a part of running the race. Going to church. Just literally going. Going. People today think that they are regular attenders when they go to church once a month. This is normal statistics throughout the country. I don't think that like going to practice once a month is considered all in. I don't think going to school once a week is considered all in. I don't think that going to the gym once a month is considered all in. Why would we apply different standards to church than we do to these other things in our lives? We're not all in if we're not going to church. 
It's, it's specifically in the text where he talks about neglecting the meeting together with the body of Christ. And I'm, I'm the pastor, so I got to be here. So it's kind of easier for me. And I'll be honest, I'll tell you, I used to tell students, and I don't care, I'll tell you. There are days where I'm like, I don't want to go to church. There are days when that happens. Did you know that? Pastors actually feel that way. Pastors come to church and we're like, it is so good to see you. And I'm not lying, I promise. But there's been a time of preparation in the morning where I'm like, Lord, help me be happy to see everybody this morning, right? Have you been there where you're, you're going around and you're talking to people? Man, it's so good to see you, so good to see you. But you've had that time on the way to church processing like, Lord, just help me. You know what I'm talking about? I hope I'm not alone in this. You're like, wow, this guy's a terrible pastor. <laughs> we have to go to church. We have to be the body. And you know what? We have to be discipled. You need to be in a relationship with some people that are, that are in your life and calling out your nonsense. We need that. And we're going to be talking a lot about that with our discipleship groups. It's going to be a big deal. So those are some really specific things. You want to know how to run the race with endurance? Read your Bible, pray, go to church, and get in a discipleship relationship. You do those four things, that's, that's basically it. You're going to make it. If you're doing those things, you're going to make it. But last thing, here's the problem, though. We, we really can't do those things on our own. And this is where it gets super important. we got to fix our eyes we got to fix our eyes. That's what he says in verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The only way for us to be all in is to focus on Jesus and follow him. He's the author and perfecter of faith. Notice, It says author. That means the the one who began it, the one who started it. And he's the leader. That word in the Greek, it, it has this idea of leading you in your faith. But it says he's the perfecter of faith. None of us have been faithful. The whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is talking about the heroes of faith when none of them were actually that faithful. But Jesus is the one who perfected it. By fully trusting God, even to the point of death, he trusted the Father. He perfected it, and then he then perfects your faith, and he pours the faith into you through the Holy Spirit. And so now I have faith that isn't even my own. It comes from Jesus as a gift because I'm saved by grace, not of myself, not of works, lest I boast. Jesus did the work. He endured the cross. He went on the cross and he took all of the pain. He despised the shame. He despised it. Some commentators, the way they understand this is not just Jesus up on the cross being like, oh, I hate the shame of being naked and dying in front of people, although that's probably true. It's more of the idea that he, he kind of like, looked on the shame with like disgust like you mean nothing to me this shame the shame is nothing i despise it i'll take the shame for the joy of knowing my heavenly father and being obedient to him because he was perfect he despised it he didn't care that people mocked him and made fun of him and threw stuff at him he didn't care he despised the shame And then he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Why did he do it? It says because he fixed, he had the joy set before him. Joy. Joy was his motivation. The joy of living for God. The joy of knowing that his heavenly father looked down on him and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The joy of knowing that after the crucifixion and after his death and after his burial, the father would raise him up in power in glory in might and that he would ascend into heaven and be at the right hand of his father back where he belongs, reigning over the universe, reigning over us. That was joyful to him. 
And so he did it perfectly. How easy is it for us to get distracted? How easy is it for us to get on our phones to respond to a text message and then it's like you black out or something and you wake up all of a sudden and you're like way far down into Facebook algorithms. Have you ever experienced something like that? Or maybe you, like, you ever done this where, and maybe I'm just telling myself, but you ever done this thing? We all, we all have these things where you whip this thing out and you go to do something and you, without looking, you know where the app is that you use the absolute most. You're just like, you're like you could do it blindfolded and it's a touch screen. So it's like, how do you know that? Well, because we're so used to it. It's so easy to get distracted. In this analogy of a race, if you know anything about racehorses, we were just recently in Kentucky, and there's the Kentucky Derby there. You know, racehorses are fitted with what they call blinkers or blinders, and they keep them from getting distracted. They're, they're these pieces of leather that sit like this on the horse's face. And it's sitting here in order to keep the horse from looking that way or that way. They want that racehorse to be focused right there. They want that racehorse to see if there's another horse in front of it, and they want that racehorse to go. They don't want that racehorse to get distracted. And so they put these blinders on so that they keep their eyes looking forward. Church family, I believe that there's a reason why things sped up and then slowed way down when it comes to our new building. I think there's a reason why things sped up and then slowed way down when it comes to our new building. I think it's because God's getting us ready to move into the building. And I think it's because God's saying, hey, you need to make sure your eyes are looking in the right place. I think God's getting our attention. I think he's telling us to stay focused. For those of you who haven't been around very long, this, this new building that's over that way, it's been a project for a long time. And for those of you who've been around for a long time, you're like, man, this is taking forever. <laughs> Amen, it is. But it's a marathon, right? And sometimes it takes forever. The question is, are we going to make sure our eyes are in the right direction? You know, this series that we're doing, uh, it's not just about the building. All in, that's not what it's about. That's a big part of it. But that's really not the majority of what we're doing in our series called All In. And I want to make sure we all understand that. It's not just about our new building. God's going to do whatever he wants with that, whenever he wants with that. The question is, is are we going to be looking in the right direction? What this is all about, it's about who we are as a church and who we are as individuals. You've seen some of the new posters that we put out in the foyer. You know, we're going to make sure we're focused on our building project. We're going to be talking about that a lot. We're going to be talking about numbers. We're going to be talking about how close things are. And we'll tell you as much as we can tell you because there's a lot of things that we just have to wait and see about. But what we need to do is make sure that that's not our number one focus. We need to make sure that when we are looking at what we are as a church, we are Second Baptist Church. We love God. We love others. We love making disciples. This is who we are at Second Baptist Church. We're not a new building. We are us. This is who Second Baptist is right here, right now. And we need to make sure that we are Second Baptist Church when we do move over into that new building. And then it's not about having fancy new bells and whistles or whatever else that the Lord's going to bless us with because he is blessing us with those things. Praise the Lord. We are Second Baptist Church. And in this series, we're going to be talking about why we do what we do at Second Baptist Church. We're going to be talking about why we would steward our own individual lives for Jesus and for the glory of God. We're going to be talking about why we do this and how we do this from God's word. We are Second Baptist Church. We love God. We love His Word. We love His glory. 
We love His call on our lives, even if that's hard. And so we are going to respond by faithfully focusing on Christ and His kingdom. We're going to love God, love others, and we're going to make disciples. We're going to do it in this building. We're going to do it in that building. We're going to do it in no building. We'll do it wherever, however God wants us to do. But we must fix our eyes on Jesus because we cannot lay aside the weights in our lives without him. We cannot embrace the race, this marathon, without him. We can't have joy without him. And so my question to us all as we end today is do you have the joy of knowing God? Do you have the joy of being known by God and being loved by God? Because if you do, then would you consider all the things that we talked about and consider this series that's coming up and would you just think about and pray about the ways in which, the things you need to do, the changes that we need to make in order to live for the purpose of glorifying God by living for Jesus and making disciples of his name. Let's pray.